Welcome to Intimacy Play, a podcast by Pleasy Play. We host open discussions with world-leading experts on couples, sex, and intimacy, so you can build a more exciting, fun, and intimate relationship. I'm your host, Michaela Silva. Hi, everyone. Today, we have a very interesting episode with Janie Lee Grace, a natural well-being expert, founder of The Sober Club, host of the Alcohol Life podcast, and the woman behind the TEDx talk, Sobriety Rocks. It's a great talk, by the way. Janie is also the author of Happy, Healthy, Sober, Ditch the Booze and Take Control of Your Life. As someone who's sober herself, Janie utilizes social media to help those who may have just quit drinking, are sober curious, or looking to reduce their alcohol intake, any of these. So welcome, Janie. Hi, thank you so much for inviting me. So just to set the mood, because you are a very different guest than what we typically have, and you do talk about well-being. So what happened? So why did you decide to talk about well-being, but specifically about alcohol-free? Mm. Well, I've been um, sort of doing the well-being thing for, for literally years. I wrote my first book, uh, which was called Imperfectly Natural Woman, um, goodness, 15, almost 16 years ago. So I was a little bit ahead of the curve. I sometimes kind of uh, joke that I was I was writing about coconut oil and kale before they had their own publicists, right? Um, so I really have been doing the kind of well-being thing a long time. Um, but what's very interesting for me now, at least looking back, is I realized that You know, I, I wrote five books on holistic living and I literally used to constantly talk about the fact that we can't focus on just one thing. It can't be just organic food or natural skincare or the chemicals you put in your home. We really do need to look at the holistic picture if we want actual well-being, if we want to, um, you know, to be as healthy and happy as possible. Um, but the other, you know, the other thing that I was missing the whole time was the fact that I was imperfectly natural and I thought it was perfectly fine to uh, knock back several glasses of wine every night. And as my, um, my, when my children were young, um, that just increased, it just ramped up. So uh, up until, I don't know, well, well, I stopped just under four years ago, but up until that point, um, it was just getting increasingly more and more. I was becoming, I had a high tolerance, so I didn't ever have a rock bottom moment. It's really important to stress that. Uh, but I was definitely drinking more than I wanted to. And it was almost like something else was controlling me. So it didn't fit with my persona as a natural health and well-being you know, someone who was passionate about that stuff. It just didn't fit at all. Um, so it wasn't until I was finally able to recognize that I'd been stepping around this massive elephant in the room all of these years. Um, and when I was finally able to ditch the booze, I realized that really was the, the missing piece of the holistic picture. And certainly when it comes to um, mental well-being, to emotional health and well-being, um, I now realize it, it underpins absolutely everything. Um, and, and, you know, I just wish, as I so often say, I just wish someone had really told me years and years and years ago, just how freaking fantastic life without is without the booze. Because I had no idea because like everyone else, it's part of our culture. It's what we do. It's accepted. It's legal. Um, so I just had never considered a life without any alcohol. Jean, just to clarify, you were not an alcoholic. You just felt that you were no. drinking a little bit more than you wanted to. Yeah, well, I mean, that's perhaps the topic of another whole podcast because um, I, I, I don't even use the word alcoholic. I think that there are a number of people, um, but it's a relatively small percentage of people who are clinically dependent and who need uh, rehab, alcohol services. Um, they can't function without alcohol. I don't you know, that's not my experience at all. And I don't, I don't work with people who are in that situation. They obviously do need um, clinical help. Um, I, I believe the majority of people uh, are drinking more than they want to. The term that we know now is gray area drinkers. So they're not at rock bottom, but they're not perfectly fine either. They're somewhere on that spectrum. And as I say in the TED talk, at least 50 shades of gray, none of them sexy, right? Um, <laughs> the problem that we have is that in our society, we are led to believe that you are either an alcoholic for everything we all know that word means, you know, and what we think of when we say that word is someone who's going to be found in a skip or putting, you know, vodka on their cornflakes or whatever. 
Uh, so we tend to think you're either an alcoholic or you are 100% fine. And actually the reality isn't that, but that's what keeps us so many people stuck for so many years because we go through so many years thinking, well, I, this, this, it feels really weird because I'm waking up at 3 a.m. I know something's not right. I know that I'm bloated and anxious. And why am I drinking again tonight? It's a Tuesday. What is going on? So we've got that voice in our head asking us, is something not right? And yet when we check in with, am I an alcoholic? Well, of course I'm not an alcoholic. I'm perfectly fine. So there's something weird. And then we start to think, oh my God, there's something really wrong with me. Nobody else feels like this. But of course, that's not the truth. There are literally millions of people who are drinking more than they want to. A survey shows that I think it's something like 80% of people who drink. Actually, when you ask them, <clears throat> excuse me, do you, do you wish that you didn't drink as much? Or would you like to not drink? The answer is usually, well, yeah, but I've I wouldn't know where to start. Exactly. Thank you for clarifying, because I think that's an important point. You, know, you don't need to feel like you are an alcoholic or you need to be one to stop drinking. Uh, absolutely. You absolutely don't have to be wait till you're at rock, rock bottom. And I think that really is my main message right there. So I say to people, don't ask yourself, am I drinking too much? Because what's too much for one person may not be too much for another. So that question is a little bit superfluous. The real question is, to ask yourself, could my life be better physically and emotionally without the booze? And if a little voice in your head says, hell, hell yes, it absolutely really could, then you owe it to yourself to give this a shot and do something about it. Unfortunately, in our society, when, when people make these initial kind of inquiries, when we, you know, in my own case, I rocked up to a GP for something else entirely. I think I was going to have a v my vitamin uh, D levels checked. Um, but because the doctor was really friendly and really nice and I just felt safe, at the end of the conversation, I, I sort of very tentatively said, actually, could I just ask you about something else? You know, I'm actually a bit worried about my drinking. Huge, it was huge for me to have to admit that. Um, and of course, her answer was as pretty much the same as any doctor, you know, or most doctors across the UK. She just kind of said, well, you know, how much are you drinking? Obviously, I lied. Everyone lies, but <laughs> they know that. They know that, right? Um, and and so she just immediately said, well, you know, you look completely fine. Just just have an alcohol-free day, you know? I mean, like I hadn't thought of that. Um, and of course, I now realize that um, it, it's not their fault. Many of them are drinking themselves. Many of them have no idea where to signpost in a vertical commas, gray area drinkers too. They only know about alcohol services for the people who are clinically dependent. They've got no idea where to send people like me, how I was. Um, and of course, the real answer, what she should have said to me is, oh my God, well done you for noticing. Just well done you. Let me point you to some amazing resources because you are right on the edge of a, a life that is going to be so much better for you. <laughs> you know, that's, that should have been the answer, right? Um, that's, that's what I want to change. I want to raise awareness of the, this positive, the positivity around sobriety, not this kind of awful feeling that, oh God, I, I'm having to give up something and that it's so important to me. I never let anyone use the phrase giving up in the sober club. They're not allowed to use those words. We have to say quit or ditch the booze because you genuinely are not giving anything up. Okay, interesting. It's, it's a very interesting uh, way to phrase it because, yeah, you're not giving up anything. You're, not, you're only gaining, absolutely. And words are really important. And one of the main issues when people ditch the booze is that their unconscious mind is telling them that they're deprived and that they can't have something that they think they want. Um, of course, over time, you start to realize, you know what, actually, real self-care is, is a ton of other things, but it isn't toxic liquid in a glass, right? Jenny, thinking from my perspective, so this is like a personal uh, comment. So I drink, I don't know, maybe a glass of wine once a week, mm -hmm. twice a week, maybe, not more than that. Do you think that... I could also benefit from not drinking that one or two glasses of wine a week or it's neglectful because it is a small amount. So this is a real mm. question. I want to understand because mm. I'm sure a lot of people identify with that as well. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think it's, it really is an each to their own question. I suppose the, the real question is um, if you couldn't have that glass of wine, would you feel hard done to? Would you feel like you were really missing out? If I said to you, you know, if for whatever reason 
um, you couldn't ha- you couldn't have that glass of wine once a week or twice a week for I don't know a year. Does that fill you with a little bit of fear or dread or worry, or is it a case of <laughs> I really couldn't care less? That's the real question. No, I couldn't care less. I enjoy okay. seeing mm-hmm. the different tastes of different mm-hmm. wines, but it's mm-hmm. more of a I don't know like tasting something. It's not mm-hmm. the feeling that I'm drinking alcohol. If you know what okay. I mean. Okay. Okay. So, so in your case, then it sounds as though you are someone who who and there are people like this who um, you have an off switch. Alcohol for you is not is not something that you're using to um, to you're not using it to relax or using it to feel better. You genuinely enjoy the taste, but it wouldn't make any difference to you if you didn't have it. So so that's that's the definition of a genuine in inverted commas mindful drinker. So having had this conversation with me, you're going to be fully aware of the negative effects of alcohol. Um, however, you choose to have a small amount and. It's really not an issue for you. So I would say, to use that same example, I would say that I am, you know, a mindful kiwi fruit eater. You know, I, I, you know, I quite like kiwi fruits. You know, and and if we've got some in the house, I'll have. I might have a kiwi fruit. You know, I might have one for breakfast. And you know, um, if we've still got some, I might make a dessert with a kiwi fruit. And if I'm if I'm really hungry, you know, uh, I might just have a kiwi fruit in the middle of the afternoon as a snack. And then if we don't have kiwi fruits in the house, whatever reason, I won't consciously put them on a shopping list or remember to buy them. I might not even eat a kiwi fruit for six months. And if the doctor said to me, you know, actually, you've got some kind of allergic thing going on and it really would be better for you if you don't eat kiwi fruits. I'd go, oh, hey, cool. All right. So, but I'm not going to join a group for mindful kiwi fruit eaters. <laughs> do you see what I mean? Yes, That's the I difference. Do. That's the difference. It's a massive difference. It's completely different to the person listening to this who knows full well that if I said to them, you ain't going to be able to have any for however long, that would cause a sense of panic within them. So if you're listening to us and you're feeling anxiety, just thinking that you cannot have your glass of wine or whatever drink it is, then you might need to rethink that. Yeah, absolutely. But, But, you know, again, my take on it would be don't, don't rethink, don't listen to this and sort of think, oh my goodness, you know, life's going to be so much worse. I can't have something I want. I can't survive without drink. That's how we all start. I know, but I'd love to be able to change it so that, you know, that's the title of my book, Happy, Healthy, Sober. If more people could, could understand from a much earlier point, hold on a minute. I don't have to have this thing controlling me. I don't have to listen to that voice in the head that says, have another glass of wine because it is toxic poison. Let's be really clear about that. It ain't got any health benefits. Do not buy into a single one of the news reports that you will see that says alcohol is good for you. It is not good for you on any level ever. ever. And Janie's a journalist, so she knew what she's (laughs) Um, saying. Yeah, I mean, I used to love those articles. I used to love them. All those, you know, red wine is good for the heart. I mean, if you read the really small print, you'll see it says you know, massively in moderation. I mean, massively. But even then, I don't buy it for one second. If you want the benefits of red wine, then, you know, have a grape, right? Uh, right. Or, or some or something that contains the resveratrol or however you say the fancy word, the antioxidants. Um, it certainly isn't the alcohol. So, um, so yeah, um, it, it, it really is a case of, I would love it if people listening to this um, if 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 the answer to that question is, could my life be better physically and emotionally without the booze? I mean, the answer for you is obviously going to be, well, no, I'm good, right? That's fine. Yeah. I'm not up for prohibition at all. But there will be people listening to this who that voice in their head immediately says, yeah, I, I absolutely know that I'm impaired by this. I know it's controlling me. I know that I'm trying to think about whether I can stop for a drink before I go somewhere. I know that I'm constantly thinking about getting, racing through the bedtime stories for the children so that I can get to my glass of wine, right? There'll be a lot of people who, if you really answer the question honestly, you know it's starting to control you rather than the other way around. And for those people, rather than this be a sort of real negative, oh, be really scared, you know, it's a real problem. I'd much rather bring in this amazing positive um, kind of approach, which is, wow, if you've recognized that, you've got so much, you know, excitement and so much of a better life to come. It's, it's wonderful. So, you know, 
let's talk about the all the amazing benefits rather than get get you all spooked about whether or not you can give up, which is usually the point at which people think, no, I, I can't, I can't do it. I've got too much going on in my life. I'm too stressed. I need to relax at the end of a busy day or whatever it is for you. Thinking about the benefits of not drinking, how different is sex, sober or drunk? I know I just got, I jumped right into it. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it, it, it's, it's something most people don't even think about until they've ditched the booze. And then, and then, I mean, what I'm, you know, I, I don't want to paint a pit, although I do want to do the completely positive approach to sobriety. I don't want to paint the picture that once you ditch the booze, all of life becomes, you know, unicorns and rainbows. Sadly, it isn't like that. Most people do go through a period where they are really actually finding out who they are again. I mean, most of us, if we start drinking at a young age, um, you know, depending on what age you are, that is a lot of years where you haven't even had any emotional maturity right? Now it's different for you because it might be one glass a week, but for many of us who were drinking every day, pretty much all the big stuff in our lives, all of the big stuff has been under the haze of booze. So falling in love, having sex for the first time, getting married, having children, going to a party, you know, everything, everything, grief, sadness, everything is under the haze of booze, right? And so we actually have often not very good at handling our emotions. We're not very good at even knowing really what we need and what works for us because everything is just, I mean, for me, my own, my self-care was having a glass of wine. So I really didn't know what I enjoyed doing. Um, I used to think I was, you know, very much an extrovert, very much a party girl. Actually, it turns out, you know what? I quite like a walk in nature, really. Um, so we often have to discover or uncover who we really are. And of course, that affects our sexuality. And for many people, they, they, they realize, oh, my God, this, I've ditched the boots. This is going to be the very first time I've ever had sex sober. Right. Wow. Think about that. It's a thing. It's, it's a thing. And it, it, can, it can really blindside you, actually. It's... Um, you know, I think some people just rock straight into it and it's fine. But I think certainly for a lot of women, um, this can uncover a whole lot of other stuff of, of, you know, how do they really feel about their body? You know, the, the whole body image conversation tends to come in because almost always what's been going on when you've been drinking is that you often don't actually like yourself very much. So there isn't that real decent sense of self-esteem and of course all those things come into play um, when we want to uh, feel you know um, emotionally available and we, when we want to feel sexual um, if we've always had sex under a haze of booze it can be quite quite a shock to the system it can be really quite um, literally shocking actually so it um, can it can end up being like a more meaningful experience, but at the same time, strange one maybe. Yeah, I, I think it depends on it depends on a lot of things. Obviously, it will also depend whether your partner is drinking. Um, you know, I've got a lot have a lot of clients in the sober club who say it's just really it feels really difficult now because my partner is drunk or I can smell my partner's breath and actually I really hate it now. Um, so really little things can suddenly begin to feel really important. Um, so I think, and of I mean, of course it's different for everyone. You can't really generalize, but I, I have found with um, a lot of people um, that, that I connect with in the sober club that they have felt that they needed um, a much more kind of, they've almost needed to relearn what it is they they like and they and they want um and that that can only be a good thing as long as you're able to have obviously good open communication um and i think that uh you know that those people who are able to do that they they've they've found a way of of usually it's a case of let's be really honest with your partner and say listen i i kind of need to um <laughs> go back to some basics you know i really actually do need plenty of time i need i need some gentleness i need some i need i need some nice talk <laughs> yeah um it it because it's not the same it's actually not the same once once you've you've overcome you know any of those issues and 
certainly the body image stuff, which can really be a big one, I think, for, for a lot of people, um, then yes, it absolutely can be, be much more meaningful. Yeah. And how do you deal when your partner doesn't want to go in the same journey as you? So for example, mm -hmm. you've decided to go into a sobriety uh, path, but your partner maybe doesn't acknowledge they have that mm -hmm. problem or doesn't acknowledge that they want to change. <clears throat> yeah, it, it, it's really difficult. And it happens in, of course, in many cases. Um, my first bit, my first tip would be um, you recognize that you're doing this for you. You absolutely have to do this for you and you alone. Um, and much as you probably would like to bring your partner along with you or your family along with you on this journey, you can't, at least not to start with. So much so that I would recommend not even having the, much of a discussion. I'm not saying don't, don't share what's going on with your partner, but actually if your partner is drinking or you know, even if they're, they don't drink too much, they probably are not the person to share all your innermost worries and thoughts with. You know, that's why I run the Sober Club, because that's what we do there, right? We're able to really share this, this detailed stuff with people who really get it. And I think if you've not been there, done it, got the T-shirt, you can't understand all these little nuances. You, you, it's not possible. So it's much better not to have these in-depth conversations at the beginning with your partner. And what tends to happen if you do, I've, I've had people who in the sober club who have launched straight in to explain exactly how they're feeling with their partner and they've, you know, and, and I'm feeling like this and this is going on for me and I feel raw inside and I feel, I, you know, I'm really messed up or I've got a headache or I'm really no, I'm feeling anxious or, you know, all this stuff that can happen in the first few weeks. And then invariably the partner will say, meaning well, will say, well, you know, you were never that bad anyway. I tell you what, just have one glass. And it's not because they don't mean well. They do mean well, but they don't understand. It's not their thing. So I would say share all your innermost thoughts and, and feelings with people who've been there, done it, got the T-shirt. It's so important to get connected with, with other people who've had this experience. Um, and just ask your partner for support. Say as little as you want to get away with and, and then just say, you know what, I'm doing this. I'm doing this thing. I'm, I'm, this is my choice. And I just really appreciate if you'd support me. You know, if you're pouring yourself a beer, can you grab me a kombucha or an alcohol free drink? You know, thank you. That's it. Or you might want to say, um, you know, uh, I am going through some stuff at the moment and, um, and, and that might mean I just need a bit more space or, or whatever, however you communicate it. What is really interesting. And I've seen this happen time and time again, is that, one, one person will, um, will go through this process. They will emerge the other, the other side. They will start to look better. They'll start to feel better. They'll get a sense of confidence. They'll start doing other things with their life. They'll have more time. They'll be much more present. They'll be much more kind because all of those things happen when you ditch the booze. And their partner will be looking on from the sidelines thinking, wow, I, I want some of that. And in so many cases... If just by just by modeling the behavior the the your partner kind of comes around to the same thing i like that suggestion so don't try to evangelize everybody definitely not no definitely not it's the most off-putting thing i mean we do most of us do go through a phase of kind of feeling great and thinking i want everyone to know about this and i'm going to ring up all of my friends and tell them to ditch the booze and it never works so you have to kind of calm down a bit and do you just 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 lead by example people will people will notice and they will say do you know what i know i kind of took the mick out of you but you know i'm really impressed how did you do that exactly you shared a little bit before that there is a different sense of identity when you yeah. go through this journey. Yeah. What steps did you take to become comfortable in your new identity? Yeah, it's a really good question. And again, I, I think it is different for everyone. But um, I think it really comes down to the fact that you, you realize once you ditch the booze, you realize that, I mean, it was possibly the longest relationship you've ever, you've ever had. <laughs> uh, and you, so you realize you've got to kind of uncover this, this, as you say, this new identity and, and, and sort of step into this new identity. And for a long time, I think it's easy to try and fight it. So people, 
assume that they've got to carry on being exactly the same person. And then you can start to feel really quite disillusioned. I mean, relationships are an obvious one, friendships. Sometimes the friendships don't fit anymore. Sometimes you aren't the person that that wants to, you know, go out clubbing or, um, you know, drinking people under the table till 2 a.m., um, and it can it's not be quite funny painful. anymore, right? It's not fun anymore. No, I mean the whole, you know, the whole thing of the whole, you know, acronym sober equals bores. Actually, the opposite is true. When people are drunk, they're really boring, really boring. And when you stop drinking, you get you get you know fed up much earlier. You really, I always tell people, book your cab home or plan to drive home earlier <laughs> than you normally would have done if you're out, um, because you won't have the same boredom threshold. Uh, when people start saying the same thing over and over again and getting drunk, it's it's when you're sober, it's quite painful actually. Um, so I do think you know that part of this is about. Um, finding new interests and and making sure that you add in stuff that uh, feels important for you. It, it really comes back to that self-care piece, actually. Um, often, you know, when people ditch the booze, they, uh, it, 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 it uncovers what it's been covering up, if you see what I mean. So there's lots of reasons why people start drinking and partly it's just habit, but also it can be to, to, to disguise something. Um, and of course, when that's left raw and out in the open, we might have to look at it. So some people do find that literally their whole life changes. Oh, it, I completely understand that because I, I, I'm picturing people that I would so suggest they could quit. Even though they're not alcoholics, I can see how different their lives would be. You know, yeah. not thinking about the next beer or the next glass of wine. Um Going back a little bit to the relationships and how that, how you, you know, how identity changes. Is it also hard to have the, I am sober now conversation with a partner mm. and maybe even with a new partner? Yeah. Um, it, it, I think it is really, really difficult at the beginning um, when it's someone you've been with for years and they, and you, perhaps you even perhaps drink alcohol has been the, almost the glue that sticks you together, actually. And you've always drunk together. It's what you've always done from your first date. You've always been drinking together. Um, so it can be really very difficult. And for the person who's still drinking, they've lost their drinking buddy, right? So that does not feel good for them at all in many cases. Um, so, you know, you might not get a great reaction, which is why I think it's much better to just rather than try and be judgmental of your partner's behavior or to try and get them to do it with you. It's much better to just say, you know what, I'm doing this for me and I just really appreciate your support. Just as you would if you were, I don't know, choosing anything perhaps if you were choosing to do some a special boot camp exercise or you were choosing to go onto a raw food diet or you were choosing to be vegan you know you 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 you're doing it for you and so um so i think you know that that can be that can be really tough for the for the the other person and i think it's really important not to slip into people pleasing mode because i've had a bunch of clients who said to me um I, I feel bad. I feel bad for my husband because, you know, he's he hasn't got anyone to drink with now. And so I feel bad for him. Um, and, and again, my suggestion there, my little mantra that I tell people is keep the ritual, change the ingredients. So if you would normally, you know, go out with your partner or sit in your conservatory and have a drink together after work, absolutely carry on doing that. But just don't have toxic liquid in your glass, right? Still have a nice glass because your unconscious mind knows that as adults, that's what we do. We like a nice glass with something nice in it. It doesn't have to be booze, right? There is the choice of alcohol-free drinks is incredible. So find something you like and keep that ritual so that they don't feel left out. How can it matter what's in your glass any exactly. more than it would, you know, any more than it would matter if you went to a barbecue and you're a vegan and other people aren't. It doesn't matter if you're having a good time. Who cares what's in, what's in, you know, what's, what, what you're consuming, right? Um, so, so number one, I would say it's really important to, to not to, not to head in directly into people pleasing mode and think, well, I must do something for them. But if it's a ritual that you've both enjoyed, keep that ritual, but just make sure there's something different in your glass. Um, if it's a new partner, um, there's no doubt about it. That's a tough one. And obviously, you know, I'm, 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 I'm a lot older. I'm not in that dating scene, but I know that people who are have said to me that they've found the, the 
absolute best thing is to be upfront from the very first conversation. That doesn't mean that you won't date someone who isn't also sober, but it's important to tell them that you are. All right. And I've had conversations with people who have, have connected with people, perhaps on a dating app or, or what, whichever way. And they've said, you know, oh, I, I just want to let you know I'm and this and that and, and I'm sober. And, and in some cases, the, um, the, the person has come back and said, what? <laughs> Seriously? No, thanks. Well, brilliant. Brilliant that you found that out so quickly. Then no need to waste time. Right. Exactly. And, then, and then other people have come back and said, Oh, oh, that's that's interesting. I look forward to hearing more about it. And then you're up and running. Um, but I think actually that honesty right at the beginning is is really important because on the one hand, you think, well, why would it matter if I'm going on a date with someone? Why would it matter? It, it, it matters because alcohol is so much part of our culture. It really it really does matter, actually. So I in that instance, I really would recommend um, being completely upfront about it. I mean, I have a partner and I've had the same partner for over 10 years. We're married. But thinking about the dating scene, if I yeah. was to say to somebody, you know, I don't drink alcohol, which yeah. actually I didn't drink when we got married. Yeah. I just didn't like the taste of it. Mm. And, you know, he, he never had a problem with it. But I was thinking if somebody actually judged me because I wasn't drinking, I would actually be, do, be the one judging. You know, why, why does that matter? Right. It, it, yeah. It, 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 unfortunately, we do. This is one of the things that can stop people from making this choice to go alcohol free because they're so worried of being judged by other people. We call them sober shamers. Right. Now, usually these aren't awful, horrible people. They are usually it, it, usually it's because you're shining a light on their behavior. Right. Um, and f for those of us who do drink too much or, you know, in my case, I did. I, I looked upon non-drinkers as boring. I mean, I had that ridiculous concept that they were boring. God knows it was me that was boring after a few <laughs> drinks, but but I just I didn't have that concept that they were um, anything other than boring, really. I mean, I look back now and I feel a huge shame that I pro probably did say to friends, oh, why don't you just drink or have another one or whatever? Um, but, you know, I, I, I don't... Um, I, I, I think you can't let that be the reason you make this, you make this decision. Um, other people may or may not judge you, but just let it, let it fall away. Give people a heads up, let them know um, that you, you've chosen not to drink. I mean, there's a ton of different ways you can do this. If you're going out socializing for the first time, some people just give their friends a heads up. They just say, oh, by the way, um, just want to let you know, I'm not, I'm not drinking. I'm, I'm not, not having any alcohol. You don't need to worry about me. I found a fabulous kombucha or whatever it is. So I'm good. Um, other people, you know, want to kind of, uh, um, well, tell a fib, basically. Just say, oh, by the way, I'm on medication, so I'm not drinking. It's cool. Whatever it takes. And then others, if you've really got pushy friends um, who are really going to make it difficult for you, sometimes you have to just simply say, uh, listen, I'm doing this for my mental health. I'm, I feel so much less anxious when I don't drink. I would hugely appreciate it if you just support me. And the best way you can support me is not mention it. Thank you. All good. See you at the bar. <laughs> good. good advice. I mean, so far... This conversation has been really interesting, at least for me. So you've talked about how important it can be for people to be sober. And I used, I chose the words very carefully with yeah. can and not is because it depends on the person. And I understand that. You've also talked about how that can change people, you know, you know feeling more a different identity and how that, uh, how that can be also very important, how that can also influence relationships. Uh, and I would love to dig deep into something that you've also mentioned before, which is self-esteem. Mm. So you mentioned that uh, alcohol can also be used as like a self-care routine. Mm. So in your opinion, how can drinking be actually considered self-care and how can you replace that self-care? You know, what else can you do if you're not drinking? Mm. Well, I mean, uh, of course it isn't self-care. It's self-harm is what it is. What we're really doing is is self-medicating. Um, there's another whole conversation there about how frustrated I get when people are given, you know, 
um, a lot of women my age, you know, will sort of rock up to a GP with menopausal symptoms and they'll just be given antidepressants, but they're not asked about their drinking. They're not asked whether or not they're caning a bottle of wine a night. So it's literally medicating on top of medication. Um, so unfortunately, you know, we are, we, 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 what can happen is we can just get ourselves in a spiral of thinking um, that, that, you know, this is, this is what we need to relax. Um, that if we want to feel uh, relaxed at the end of a busy day, or we want to feel more confident for an interview or an event, or we want to feel sexy or almost whatever it is we want to feel, we think alcohol is the answer. Funny that, <laughs> how it can, interestingly enough, you know, both stimulate and relax us. Funny that. The reality, exactly. is, it the reality is it doesn't do any of those things. We just think it does. Um, but there's no doubt about it. When you get, I, I usually advise my clients that they do need to get a sense of the logic. So it is quite important to actually, if you haven't already, do a little bit of reading around just how bad alcohol is. Actually get that clear. Let's not actually sugarcoat it because, you know, it is a drug. In fact, studies show it's the number one most harmful drug when you take into account all other aspects to the economy, to the family, to the, you know, um, the work workforce, a, a, everything, crime figures. It's the number one most harmful drug. So let's not sugarcoat it. Okay. It's terrible. Um, but, but in addition to kind of knowing just how bad it is for us, it's even more powerful when we can recognize that it's been it's been keeping us small. It's been dampening us down. It's been covering everything up. It's been making us anxious. It's been making us feel bad about ourselves because it's poison ultimately. And if we can catch sight of a life without that, we can recognize that, okay, well, I, want, I wonder, and this is where this lovely word curious comes in. I could become curious about what else would be there for me. What who who am I? Who could I be without booze? Could I start to like myself? Because a lot of people don't. Um, and often it's not till you really properly uh, recognize this stuff and you and you're able to ditch the booze that you can s step into that identity. You know, to use that expression that we used before, um, and actually rock up to to meditation and to really look at what self care really means for you. Because it certainly isn't, you know, sitting nursing a glass of wine, as I used to think. There are many more things we can do, but it depends what works for you. And I think that's that's what you have to be willing to have a look at. OK, what what does work for me? What does lift my spirits? What else can I do to soothe, in inverted commas, what can I do to soothe myself rather than having toxic liquid? How was your journey in, in that regard? So how did you discover what could be the best self-care and self-love routine for you? Well, I think, you know, I was already, I was slightly unusual in that I was already um, doing all of this stuff and talking about all of this stuff because of the work that I did. It's, it's quite ironic. Now I think back, you know, I'm a Hay House author. I was interviewing uh, med leading meditation gurus and self-love experts. So there wasn't anything that I didn't know about this on paper, but I wasn't living it. It wasn't, it wasn't my personal experience. I just thought it was for everyone else. Um, so for it's me, it's always for somebody else, right? I, 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 exactly. So for me, when I when once I ditched the booze, once that sort of layer, if you like, had come off, and I was able to start to ask myself about the real me, then I then I was able to come to meditation and um, even going for a walk in nature uh, as uh, in an from an authentic place. I think I'd been doing everything from this kind of this this mask that I was I'd been wearing um, before. So um, I I always encourage people to 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 just check in with what they love to do or check in with what makes them feel good. That's healthy, right? Because often you know if you're craving alcohol, for example. Um, if you've been drinking for years, you decide to stop, but you've got such a strong craving. It's usually not a physical craving. The alcohol will have left your body in a very short space of time. So it's not physical, but it is what's going on in your head. So the important thing is to recognize what, what are the thoughts that are going on here? What's the feeling I'm trying to create? And often you can answer yourself and say, well, you know what? I, I, I just want to feel relax. I just, I just want less stress. I've had a really stressful day. I just want to not think about that stuff. 
right? And if that's what it is, then then you're going to need a little list of resources that do that for you. But maybe it is a walk in nature. Maybe it's a bath with aromatherapy oils. Maybe it's listening to a podcast. Maybe it's doing some gardening. I don't know what it is for you or for others, but, but we need to discover it for ourselves. And go and do one of those things. And if it doesn't work and you're still craving, do another one. I think you've given us so many interesting advices because it, it does depend on the person. Absolutely. You know, like I would love to be able to do meditation, but I stress the whole time. I keep thinking you're not supposed to think, you're not supposed to think, so it's just ridiculous. Um, but I found an app and I love the the sleeping meditation. Yeah. Because instead of telling me not to think, it's telling me what to think. So Exactly, yes, guided, your, uh, guided visualization. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And I fall asleep in like seconds, especially if I'm very tired. I, that's yeah. the best thing for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. I wasn't supposed to be sharing about me, but yeah, just a, a, a side note. Mm. Because this has been a very interesting conversation. I would love to close it off with a question that we ask to all our guests. How do you keep your relationship opening, open, exciting, and intimate? Mm. Uh It's a really interesting question. I think um, I think it comes I really think it comes back to communication. I think it's if I if we go through a kind of a bad patch, it's usually because I'll look back and I'll realize I've been so busy and so consumed with everything that's going on with me that I haven't had the opportunity to um to really give the relationship time. And I think the mistake so many of us make is we, we kind of think our relationship is just there, you know, like uh, we take, we really do take it for granted and actually you do have to put the work in. Um, so I think the communication is everything. And not everyone finds that easy, um, but there's no doubt about it. When you do open up and have a proper conversation and be willing to um, talk about what it is you, you need, um, then I think that's from that place, you know, you can create the magic. Um, but I think sometimes you can go for years, literally years, and, and not have a proper conversation, but, but individually you're building up resentment. <laughs> and then that resentment blows, but then you kind of realize, oh my God, but I, ne I didn't actually ever share that I was feeling like that. So I think if, if each person can take some responsibility, um, for sharing what's going on, it, it can help massively. 100%. I love your advice. Janie, where can people find you if they need help, if they just want to talk, if they want to see content from you? Yeah, so if you go to thesoberclub.com, thesoberclub.com, that's platform there with blog posts and competitions and you can watch my TEDx talk. Um, so lots of stuff is there. We also have a membership side which is you know just a very small amount of money per month where and there's masses of content and uh free uh, stuff included and uh and, and an exclusive group which is where you know so much magic happens and i bring in a lot of experts um but then of course there's also the podcast which is free to listen to alcohol free life podcast on any platform and uh and my book is a great place to start happy healthy sober um it's not just about ditching the booze it's also for people who've been sober for ages or or indeed people who um don't have an issue with alcohol but they just want to really focus on their optimum health and well-being i've got lots of experts in there who share some amazing stuff around nutrition and mindfulness and meditation and yoga and just about everything else well it's been lovely having you on the podcast um, thank you i hope you've enjoyed it thank you yes yeah, been great fun thank you and that was intimacy play we hope you enjoyed it To find out more about Pleasy and how we can take your relationship to the next level, visit pleasyplay.com. Then also make sure to search for Intimacy Play in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found, and click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Pleasy, thank you for listening.